Actually, let me start again here. Stuart Strolley with Sailing World Magazine. Welcome back to our interview series from the America's Cup World Series in Newport, Rhode Island. Standing next to me is Ray Davies, the tactician for Emirates Team New Zealand. As Ray was just mentioning, a beautiful day on the water. What sort of things were you focusing on this early in the week? I know you mentioned there's a lot of traffic out there. It's difficult to get some training. And what were you trying to accomplish? Yeah, today is Sunday. And uh, man, every man and his dog was out there. It was very busy on the race course. So it was quite hard to uh, actually have a good training session today, but we, we did sail with Artemis and um, we just did some time on distance runs to the start line and, and a couple of laps just out here. Yeah. So I, I imagine that it uh, brings back memories of home because of course Auckland, the city of sails, is equally as passionate about the sport and when you guys are out there sailing the America's Cup, the traffic was just as bad, if maybe a little, yeah. bit, a little bit more organized there. Yeah, no, that's right. It was, it was pretty chaotic. and. Uh, it was chaotic in Auckland, but you know when we actually do the racing, the, the course marshals will, will create a, a race course for us. But uh, today, everyone wanted to get close, and uh, a lot of hooping and hollering. And uh, I think they're pretty excited to see the, the cats in Newport. Yeah. You mentioned the hooping and hollering. You know, we were sitting there watching you guys bring the wing down, and, and the, the, you know, the, the expressions from people looking at this wing and watching you guys bring this thing down. It's pretty clear this is not the same America's Cup. Uh, are, do you notice the difference with these boats between the old ACC boats? Oh yeah, for sure. You know the wow factor is here, and you know the, the old boats were spectacular to look at and very elegant, but these you know are clearly extreme. The way they accelerate, the way they fly a hull, uh, the way that all the boats deploy at that first mark and take off at you know 24, 25 knots, it is pretty cool. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely got an X factor to it. Yeah. I, I know during your time you've worn a lot of different uniforms, but I'm imagining this is the first time you've had to wear a yellow construction vest while you're doing your job and sailing. Yeah, yeah, it's compulsory to wear a hard hat and a yellow safety vest, so we keep our race helmets on, and uh, yeah, we all had to not allowed to wear our normal jandals either. Have to wear shoes. Okay, great. So you, you, you mentioned the bringing this wing down. Tell us, in, in terms of, of your job, how much extra off off the water stuff does the wing add to your to your role in this boat oh uh, yeah not, not a lot it's not too big a deal you know it takes sort of 40 minutes from when we hit the dock to getting the boat and the wing out so it's not too big to, you know we've got a crane operator here and it's all pretty efficient so yeah it adds half, uh, half an hour 40 minutes at the end of the day but it's, it's actually not too big a deal and would you prefer to leave it in the water or the team prefer to bring it out every night? What's, it seems like there's a little bit of a, we know there's a couple in the water every day, yeah. there's a couple not in the water. How does it all work? It's, it's easier to leave it on the water, then it's just good to go, then you've got the same process in the morning, so you yeah. sort of, you know, save an hour and a half. But uh, it's actually not too big a deal to pull it out if there's any sort of maintenance required. Uh, it's good to check the ball fitting. There's been some issues in the past with a bit of wear and tear there. So, you know, you feel a bit more comfortable and you've, you've had it out and checked everything, but they're pretty hardy. We've had them for a while now, so um, you know you iron out any little little, little faults with them, and uh, you know they're, they're very very versatile. You could leave it out there for a couple of months; it wouldn't really be a problem. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe in their second lives as, as recreational boats, we'll see them drifting around there. You've now had had these boats for for over a year. You've sailed. This will be the sixth event. Uh, I think initially your role, the tactician's role, was was an overwhelming role because you had to keep track of everything going on the race course and then you had quite a bit of boat handling responsibilities which of course it varies team by team every team does a little bit yeah. differently has your the phys your physical role becomes automatic to the point where you can focus enough energy or as much energy on tactics as you used to when you were on the ACC boats where you had a lot less to do or are you still yeah. compromised no very very compromised <laughs> <laughs> not incredibly compromised on these 45s um, it's pretty hard for any of the guys forward on the coal face to actually help with the tactics. You, you poke your head out and you chirp in when you can. You do the ley lines downwind. There's, there's certainly some areas where you're in the best position on the boat to do tactics when you're down to leeward. So you, you, sit, you do a lot downwind, upwind, getting involved in the tax. You know, you feed a little bit of information, but if I get sort of four comments back to Dean up a beat, I've done pretty well. Generally, he's got to pick it himself. So, so wh where do you, where do you contribute most to the, the performance of the boat upwind? What are, what are the things you're doing that, that are develop, aiding the team? Hiking my belly out <laughs> over the side of the boat. Um, you know, and then just refreshing the guys on what the current's doing. And you know, more, it's more a strategy type role, a little bit more long term, as opposed to the short term, we must tack right now. You know, it's a, sort of more thinking a little bit more up the track and just painting a bit of, pitch, bit of a picture and making sure we don't make any silly mistakes. Yeah. Well, look, as we move to the 72s, you're obviously going to have a little bit more freedom, I would imagine. But the course configuration is going to remain the same. So, so one of the questions I had was, 
when you look at this style of sailing, and what is the, the most difficult aspect, or what impacts the tactics most negatively? Is it the speed of the boats? Is it the, the size of the course, the width of the course? Is it the, you know, the, 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 the tack loss, the, the amount of cost attack? What, what is hurting you the most when you try and call tactics? Well, you're really constricted by the boundaries, and, and these uh, courses out here in the 45s, and, and, and the cup as well, you're very, very limited with what, with what you can and can't do up the course, so there's some very much some set moves. It's very hard to pass once you're in the lead and you're in phase with a guy. You know, he can't just go all the way out to the lay line and follow you in. He's limited and he gets to the boundary before you quite often, so you, you, you know, there's a lot of set plays and you're better off hurting the guy behind than doing your own thing. Uh, so, you know, the, a lot of the tactics have kind of been taken away. It's almost like a you know, that air hockey game, you just get bounced down the, the course and, and you're very limited with what you can do when you're behind and uh, you sort of tend to just stay with them if you're ahead. That said, we, we have seen, anyone who's watched this has seen Team New Zealand come back from countless bad starts and, and work its way back to the top, of the top of the leaderboard. How are you guys doing that? Yeah, well, the fleet racing side of it, sure. You know, fleet racing, there are opportunities, mainly at the bottom gate and which um, top mark you choose because there's definitely options. Dean's, Dean's being a real, uh, <laughs> real funny guy in the background there. Now, well, there's definitely some options with the two marks at the top. So you, you get the right one there, you can suddenly make a big jump. And uh, certainly the bottom gate, obviously there's some, some opportunities there. The pack slows each other down. If you've got a little bit of a lead, you can take off and nearly lap people. Yeah. So, you know, it's just it's more fleet management. And there's a couple of options you get around the track in the fleet racing that you can uh, pick up places. Let's look ahead. Uh, I imagine that you, like, like all of the other big four teams, are going to be launching your 72 in the near future. You have 30 days of sailing over the next, uh, next year almost, a little less than that, probably eight months. What do you, what do you see in the next uh, six to eight months for Emirates Team New Zealand? Oh, well, it's all about the big boat. You know, the fastest boat's going to win unless you have some serious gear failure. So it's all about speed. You know, this has been great to, to get our head around wings and, and what bulky hull sailing's all about. But... At the end of the day, you just got to be fast in these uh, new boats, and you got to be able to get them around the track. Obviously, you know you don't. It's a, it's a very limited, tight course, and uh, you know we're going to be focused on, you know, the mechanics of the boat, making sure we can sail the boat around the course properly. I'm sure that you, like everyone, know have heard about Artemis's failure with their their 72 wing. Um, I'm guessing you probably know a little bit more than the average journalist, but none of us really know, seems to know too much. They've kept a pretty good lid on things. But did that, the fact that they had a failure, does that give you guys pause? Did you, that take everyone back to re-double check all your, your engineering uh, calculations? Yeah, uh, for sure it's a real eye-opener. And, you know, that can happen to any team, and it's not going to be the only catastrophic failure, for sure. The, the, the wings are fragile, you know. It's a, it's a difficult cuff, and we're at the beginning of the learning curve. So, you know, feel sorry for them that it happened, but, you know, they... They've learned from it, and we've learned from what happened to them as well. But uh, you know, everyone's engineering is so different to you know their own campaign. Yeah, you relook at the numbers, but I think everyone's probably going down in different paths anyway. So uh, yeah, it's hard to hard to really learn too much from what happened to them. What can you tell us about the? You guys have a, a, a relationship, cooperation relationship with with Luna Rosa. What can you tell us about your launch training schedule over the next uh, three or four months for the 72? Yeah, we're not, we're, you know, about a month away from sailing. And, um, you know, obviously, yeah, we've got a pretty close agreement with Prada. They'll be observing what we're doing. And then the boat's a few months behind us. Once they get theirs in the water, you know, we'll observe what they're doing. And then we'll do a little bit of uh, racing against each other. And, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a nice advantage to have a training partner. Yeah. You've done some, some pretty hairy sailing. Of course, you were on John Kostecki's Ilbrook team that won the Volvo Ocean Race nearly a decade ago. It's amazing to think wow. you've been doing it this long, <laughs> right? Yeah. But uh, looking ahead, give me your assessment of the pucker factor on the 72 versus everything else you've done. Is it going to be the top of the heap, or will it yeah. maybe be below a 60 in the Southern Ocean? It's going to be pretty tight. <laughs> um, it's it's, it's going to be up there, but again, in a sense, is. Well, we've sort of got to wait and see. Like, for sure it's going to be hairy at times. You're going to be crossing the boat, the trampoline, with water just ripping over you, and you don't really have the protection that you have on a Volvo 70. Like, obviously the guys on the bow of a 70, 
have issues, but they tend to dial the boat right down and minimise waves when the guys are going forward. When you're back on the boat, you're clipped on and you're tucked in behind the sail rack. On these, you're totally exposed, so you're just going to be hands on the tramp, hanging on for dear life at times. So it's going to be, yeah, some serious pucker factor at, at times. Sounds like great television. Yeah, okay, it okay, will, okay. yeah, will be. It will be fantastic. There's no doubt about it. Um, it, it will be good TV, you know. We'll see how close the racing is, but hey, it, it's all about the TV. Yeah. Last question. We, seems like we've got a good response here. I, I tell you, being a lo Newport local, I think the, the, there was a lot of uh, anxiety about what sort of public response would be for this event. You just never know what, what people are going to turn out, especially for something as unique as this. Seems like the response is good. What's, what's it like back home? How closely are people following the America's Cup World Series? Not necessarily the Cup itself, because we know yeah. they're focused on that, but the World Series, how much do you have to answer for your results on, a, on, a, on an event-by-event -event basis? I think the avid sailors follow it, and it's getting TV coverage back home, but I don't think it's really hit the masses. Everyone's still confused, and they're in a daze about what on earth has happened with the America's Cup. Uh, most of the country still thinks it's tied up in courts. Like they, they really, they're not engaged yet. And we haven't made an effort with our only our little 33 footers back there of really engaging the public. But, but when we launch the 72 very soon, it's going to be a huge event for us. Prime Minister's going to be there. And it's, it's going to be big. And it's a big visual thing. And I think the public's minds will switch into gear and they'll, they'll realise what it's all about. So you have a haka dance before the launch of the 72? Yeah, Dean is going to lead a haka, I think. <laughs> I think I would pay some. I would pay some good money to see Dean do the haka. Yeah, <laughs> I think you'd have to pay him quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ray, well, thank you very much for your time and insight. Uh, good luck this week sailing. We're all looking forward to seeing this. So, yeah. best of luck out there on the water. Cheers. Thanks, Joe.